today's video is the second part in the little mini series about installing CO2 sensors in older buildings for the purpose of reducing the outside air and saving energy. In the previous video we went to the first issue. In this video we're going to wrap up and go through all three remaining issues. I'm going to try and simplify each point as much as I can so that I can get through all of them in one video. I don't really want to have to do an individual video for each one. So the second issue in the series is the tenant's outside air rates. So the tenant obviously is the person that's you know renting the floor and they've got you know a hundred people sitting on the floor, their staff. Previously we discussed this idea of installing two CO2 sensors on each floor on the common return ducts. So in the north we'd have this one sensor measuring the average of this half of the floor and the south of the building we had a, another common CO2 sensor measuring the average of that half of the floor. And the key word here is average. Although across the entire building we're doing a maximum select, we're choosing the highest CO2 sensor in the building, or if it's just the low rise air halyards, we're choosing the highest CO2 sensor in the low rise and then the highest CO2 sensor in the high rise. However, each individual sensor on the return duct is measuring the average of that floor. Now most buildings probably don't have completely open plan floors and certainly the whole building of, of 30 floors would not be completely open plan. It might be open plan when they first build the building which is a point probably worth considering. So although we're measuring the average CO2 of this half of the floor, we don't know what the CO2 reading is in all of the other enclosed spaces. So boardrooms, offices, meeting rooms, we don't know what the CO2, we just know the average CO2. So if you're a BMS company and you are occupying a floor, you are the tenant. On this side of the floor, we might have our installation department and over here we might have our service department and our uh, products department plus boardrooms and meeting rooms dotted through that. So if we were measuring the average CO2 for this whole area, perhaps it was reading 700 parts per million. And you know maybe the install department and the, the service department you know, were half loaded, you know, there were people on site or at meetings, maybe in the products department, everyone's there, that's quite a busy, quite a full area of the building. So it's probably like a passageway and there's doors that go into each of these sort of areas, you know, there's partitions between them, it's not an open plan arrangement. So although the average CO2 is 700 parts per million, the CO2 reading in the products department could be, you know, a thousand parts per million, because we haven't got a sensor there. So our demand control ventilation control strategy looks at the 700 and says, oh well we can reduce the outside air. So we start reducing the outside air, as we're doing it, the 700 goes up, 750, 800, and then we stop. So we've reduced the outside air, and we've raised the CO2 to 800. That's what we want. That has achieved you know, our, the purpose of our project. That's a tick in the box. Obviously, the products department, their CO2 has gone up to 1,200 parts per million because we didn't have a sensor in that zone. So if the tenant sort of is feeling a bit stuffy or whatever they're doing and they go and employ another consultant or somebody to come here and take some readings and they take a few readings or they, they do some sort of calculations they work out that you know the there's a low below code amount or below the lease agreement of outside air that zone that's a big problem for the building owner or the landlord so perhaps the lease agreement says that the tenants will be will be supplied you know, 10 liters per second per person of outside air. And now you don't have that. So where originally this project was quite expensive, $60,000 for 60 sensors, now you've just realized, well, to actually have a fully functioning system here, we're gonna have to go install more CO2 sensors 
in all of these enclosed spaces. So we have a good representation of what the CO2 is. If you've got a boardroom and you know 20 people go in there and the CO2 goes high, like you know, if you're reducing the outside air coming onto the floor, that's gonna affect that room. It, it does get more complicated because there should be a separate tenant outside air duct into that boardroom. You, not all buildings actually have that. But either way, so you've got to go do something now. So that, that two sensors per floor, it's just become four sensors per floor, eight sensors per floor, 10 sensors per floor across 30 floors. So you can imagine now that to do this properly, because you know, just using the return, that's not gonna work actually. And, and to exaggerate that even worse is when we propose to our client that we're gonna put a CO2 sensor in the air handling unit return or the, the common returns up the riser into the plant room, that's even worse because now we're measuring the average CO2 for the entire rise, which means that if a whole floor is sitting at 1,500 parts per million, you know, it's a, it's a call center and they've overloaded or whatever it is, you're not going to see that because you're averaging out across all these floors. So the worst thing in the world is a CO2 sensor on the air handling unit for demand control ventilation. Then the second worst thing, which is often done, is return sensors on all the floors on the common risers. To do it actually properly, so that you meet the code and you meet the agreement between the landlord and the tenant, you probably should have a CO2 sensor in every enclosed space. And I'm sure we can all see that is gonna blow this whole thing out of the water. Now we're talking like a couple of, you know, $200,000 of project work. So that was the second issue. The third issue in this whole thing is that CO2 sensors in the HVAC market, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, the cheap ones that we buy are very inaccurate. Now I have evidence of this. I have a really comprehensive report and study from the US um, that proves this, but I can't find it anywhere on the internet and I don't feel comfortable presenting it on my channel in case I'm gonna get in trouble. So just believe me when I say to you that CO2 sensors, the ones that we buy, are not very good. Um, I was even doing witnessing a few months ago on a site and um, I went through all the CO2 sensors at witnessing, I opened up all the graphics with the tech sitting there and on every single floor there was at least one or two sensors that was reading either very low you know, or very high and they had to be replaced and the BMS engineer told me that um, they replaced about two out of every ten sensors that they bought of the CO2 sensor. And I'm sure those of you that are, are doing this sort of work are probably quite aware of it, that CO2 sensors, they're very bad. So this means that, and because we're doing max select, it exaggerates the issue because in this low rise where we've got at least 15 floors, that's 30 sensors on the returns, we probably have more to have a proper coverage of the whole floor. If you've got you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, CO2 sensors and you're doing a maximum select, you can be guaranteed at least one of those sensors, probably more, is reading 100 parts per million too high. I just made that up. And of course, there'll be a whole bunch that are reading too low. When I was doing witnessing, there were sensors reading, you know, 350 parts per million. Like, if you Google the world average of CO2, I think it's around um, 405 parts per million. So if you see a CO2 sensor reading 400 parts per million, like that's what the CO2 reading is in the Amazon or the Antarctic sort of thing. I'm slightly guessing and exaggerating. But the bottom line is CO2 sensors are terrible. This means, and because the impact is dramatic, one sensor reads high, we max select it, and we drive the outside dampers fully open to the, not fully open, we drive them open to the design position, design outside air rates. So one sensor, two sensors, makes this entire project completely worthless. So to fix that, you have to continually check these sensors and replace them or calibrate them. So in the perfect world, the client's paying $100,000 
$200,000 for the project, and then they've got to pay the BBS company an extra, you know, let's just say, I don't actually know, but let's just say $10,000 a year to check the CO2 census every year. Got to keep checking them. So again, in my mind, that's a deal breaker. It's not just a big cost to install, it's also you know, a continual increased maintenance cost to keep this control strategy effective working and you know, be worth all the effort that it was to install it. So the fourth and final issue that I can think of is um, when we are gonna reduce the outside air on these outside air dampers, we know what the design outside air is. Um, we know that and we wanna reduce it. And we discussed before, you know, how far down can we reduce the outside air? And we spoke about this positive pressurization and the building's ventilation rate, but we don't know, BMS people, even I don't know, we don't know what that rate is. So again, because we're talking about doing this properly here, um, to find out what that bottom limit is, which I call minimum makeup air, so I call the top the design outside air, the minimum makeup air, makeup air, to achieve positive pressurization and minimum ventilation. To work that out, the owner or somebody has to probably go and engage a mechanical engineer or consultant to work it out. You know, work out what that number should be. All sorts of calculations. And then, unless you have um, flow grids and volume sensors on the outside air ducts, which most buildings don't have, um, you also probably need a mechanical commissioning tech to come to site and then balance the air handling unit, balance that outside air, and then close the damper, close the damper, close the damper, close the damper, take readings with their, their pitot tube and say, yep, 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 that, right, that's you know 200 liters per second or 500 liters per second. And he tells you the damper minimum position is whatever it is. So that process of getting the consultant involved to do the calculations and then do the mechanical balance to give you the information that you need for the, the, the lower limit, that is a mini project all on its own. I'm not saying that we, we throw demand control ventilation out of the window. Um, I'm just saying to start off with, and, and the main takeaway for the series is, do not start ever with demand control ventilation. The thing is full of holes everywhere. You start off in other places and you work down the list chiller optimization, air handling units, VAVs, fan coordinates, you do CO2, oh, sorry, CO, car park ventilation. You do all those things first. And at the very bottom of the list, this is your last one. Because sometimes what happens is, after you've spent two years smashing through energy efficiency opportunities and you're getting really a lot of success in the client's energy efficiency rating, the building's energy efficiency rating, in Australia, the neighbor's rating, it's coming up, everyone's doing high fives. If they're going for six star neighbors rating and they've, done, they've spent millions of dollars, new chillers and new boilers and variable speed drives and um, lift destination control systems and LED lighting, they've done all these things and they're sitting at 5.9 star rating, they just can't get to 6.0 and they're desperate for it. There are clients and I, have, I know some of them where they don't care about the return on investment. They don't care what it costs. Spend anything, they have to achieve that building energy efficiency rating at all costs. To either, usually to either retain their anchor tenant, where the lease says it must be whatever the rating is, or they um, there's like a churn through that the tenants or their leases are expiring and there's a big drive to get new tenants into the building, new anchor tenants, you know, tenants are taking up 10 floors or 15 floors, big, big companies. They are trying to attract the highest profile tenants. They will pay the highest rents and they have to get a five star neighbors rating or a six star neighbors rating, whatever it is, probably not six, probably five. Um, in those cases, you pull out the demand control ventilation strategy and you spend two hundred thousand dollars, and you save them a tiny bit of energy that just gets them onto the five point zero and achieves their targets. That's when you do that. Demand control ventilation does work in modern day buildings where the buildings are designed 
for a massive oversupply of outside air. Demand control ventilation, my personal opinion, does not stack up in buildings that were designed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, where you are now on your second or third BMS system. Those buildings, for all these reasons, don't suit demand control ventilation.